Hello there. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to be talking about Chapter 17 and Chapter 18. Chapter 17 looks at the newborn transition from birth uh, to its neonatal life. And then Chapter 18 is going to look at the nursing care of the newborn after that transition period. So this course is what we've been talking about. Here we have um, uh, birth and the best place for this baby to go as long as the baby is stable is directly to that mom. And by being placed skin to skin, this transition period is going to actually happen um, easier for this baby. So skin to skin does a lot of things for our baby. It allows the baby to start to control its breathing, start to control its heart rate, in matching mothers and help and, and by being close to mom, it will uh, allow this to happen in a calm setting. Believe it or not, this has only been um, really utilized in practice for about the last three to four years using putting skin to, putting the baby skin to skin right after delivery. There's lots of evidence to support it. It does lots of things. It uh, starts to regulate blood sugar. It decreases bleeding for mom. All of this is evidence based. So this is definitely where our babies need to go, uninterrupted skin to skin time, regardless of the method of feeding that mom chooses. One of the tools that we do in our transition period is this short little uh, assessment that is called an APGAR, named after Virginia APGAR. And the APGAR is an acronym that stands for um, appearance, pulse, grimace, um, I can't think what the last A is there. I'll think of it in just a second. And respiration. So we are giving them a short assessment, and it's a just a quick way to know how well our baby's doing. So for instance, under appearance, we would be looking at color, and we would either give a zero, a one, or a two based on what criteria the baby met at that point. Again, heart rate would be giving an, a number, zero, one, or two, based on the criteria that the baby meets respiration, reflex, and muscle tone are the all the um, uh, activity. So A, the other A is activity. Um, this would allow us to know how well our baby is doing in that transition phase. So looking at this picture, how well do you think this baby is doing? It's got a nice big grimace because it's crying. It's pink all the way down to its toes. You can tell that it's crying and taking big deep breaths so you know the respiratory effort is there, it's got a nice flexed tone, and if it is this pink, we know that its pulse is doing what it needs to do. So this baby would probably be a 10. That's pretty rare to give a 10 to a newborn, because usually they have a little bit of a uh, color that hasn't quite gotten all the way down to their extremities yet, but this baby is showing you what a um, positive APGAR looks like. What do you think about this baby? This baby, again, you're looking at tone, you're looking at reflexes, grimace, color, respirations. And then when you can look over at this baby, you can see that this is definitely something um, looks a little bit different. And this baby also has that classic preterm look. They call it the frog-like posture. And so I'm suspecting that this is a preterm baby. And obviously, by the picture, we're going to be needing to give this baby some support. So the app really is only used to be able to give information quickly when you're giving report or handing over your patient after delivery, after recovery. And if you say app scars were eight and nine, we do them at one minute and we do them again at five minutes. And if I say the app scars are eight and nine, then you automatically know that baby transitioned well during its first few minutes of life. If I say the app scars are two and seven, that means something different. We had to support this baby and help this baby get to um, a, a point of transition where it could independently function on its own. And so that would be a baby that we would watch a little bit more closely. So three things that really have to happen in our transition to extra uterine life is that respiratory gas exchange. Now these babies have to take a breath push all the fluid that's in their lungs out and uh, uh, ex start to exchange that unoxygenated and oxygenated blood within the lungs where they did not have to do that before. 
They also have circulatory modifications that go along with that respiratory gas exchange. There are two areas in the heart that are now going to um, close up and, and force the uh, heart, blood flow to now go over to the lungs. We also are going to see um, the area that was not going to the liver, the, the placenta was functioning as the baby's liver. Now that is going to close off and the liver is going to have to start to function on its own. And so all of these transitions happen pretty seamlessly without a lot of, um, we don't actually see them happening, but what we wanna look for is if they're not working well. And a couple of ways we would know that is if we saw respiratory distress in the baby or color changes, central cyanosis that tells us this baby is not um, managing extra uterine life well. And then for our changes in the organ systems, we're going to be looking for hyperbilirubinemia, which is a sign that the liver is um, not functioning well. It's kind of a little traffic gem in there. We'll talk about more about that in just a minute. But these are two of the big things that we're looking for in that transition. Um, hyperbilirubinemia isn't going to start for uh, uh, several hours, a couple of days even, but that respiratory gas exchange, whether it's function or not, will be apparent very quickly. So some of the other things that we want to avoid, because this baby is trying to transition into its extra uterine life, we don't want it to be cold. By causing this baby to be cold, we will decrease the ability of it to be able to do the other things that we were just talking about. So we want to make sure the baby stays on a nice warm mom. If mom is cold, then baby will be cold. We want to warm our stethoscope up before we touch the baby. We want to make sure that anything that is um, coming in contact with the baby has been warm. That's why we use warm blankets to stimulate them right after delivery. We usually put a hat on their head to help them decrease the amount of heat loss through their head. Um, it's actually been found that this may or may not be evidence-based, and that's one of the things that may be changing in the near future, but until uh, for now, we are still putting the hat on this baby's head and really helping to maintain the warmth of the room. Sometimes during delivery, mom has wanted the room to be uh, cooled down because she's working very hard running a marathon, and now we need to warm it back up. We want to try to avoid the different ways that baby can lose heat. The other thing we see that our baby is challenged with is um, uh, we, they don't have, um, they have iron storage in the beginning from mom and they're going to lose that around month three or four. And the bilirubin, which is the byproduct of breaking down excess, excess red blood cells, is going to be increased over the first couple of days. There are certain factors that will increase it even more. And as we continue talking about the newborn, we'll talk more about jaundice, but the liver is immature. And depending on how the birth went and some other factors surrounding the delivery, we may or may not see an overproduction of this bilirubin, which is the byproduct of breaking down these excess red blood cells. And that bilirubin is really toxic at high levels. And we will discuss that more in just a minute. But this is, this is a big concern for all babies and we need to um, be on the lookout for it from the very beginning. Some of the things that happen in the gastrointestinal system is there's a mucosal barrier that is developed in the gut that helps prevent the penetration of harmful, harmful substances. We know that colostrum, which is the first milk, is it, it helps to build this mucosal barrier. It helps to fill in the gaps and the holes if there are any in this mucosal barrier. So it's really important, if at all possible, that babies receive colostrum in the first um, few hours. This is uh, important for the development of their immune system as well as um, the health of their lining of their gut. Also, their baby, the tummies are very small. They're anatomically very small. The size of a newborn stomach is somewhere between a grape and a cherry. And as we start to feed these babies, they only need small amounts to start that process. They also um, have a little bit of an immature uh, sphincter. And so they, 
in that stomach. And so they, if they have large amounts of food, it will automatically come back up and they will vomit. And some babies vomit regardless whether it was too much or not. So we want to be careful not to overfeed and we want to be careful um, making sure that they, the parents have a bulb syringe, which I will describe in just a minute, in order to help these babies clear the airway if they are bringing up what is in their stomach. So here's that newborn stomach size. Like I said, it's somewhere between a grape and a cherry. That's about a teaspoon, which surprisingly enough, that's about how much colostrum is in each breast at, on the day of birth. And so babies will take in small amounts and then slowly as their um, milk supply with the mother increases, we see their stomach start to increase, their stomach size. And so again, I like to refer to things um, in ways that parents can understand. So if I say your baby's tummy is the size of a cherry or your baby's tummy is the size of a walnut, they completely can understand that. And, and here I know you're thinking, but sometimes babies will drink a whole bottle or if the parents um, offer them a supplement in a bottle, they just suck the whole thing down and the parents think that they were very hungry, that, that it was, they, they took all of that volume because they were hungry. Actually, what's happening with a bottle is the baby's just trying to control its airway. So whatever is in that bottle, as long as you're holding it up to the baby's mouth, it will continue sucking because it has to keep sucking in order to keep its airway open. So um, we need to be very cognizant of educating parents about the size of their baby's tummies and whether they're bottle or breastfed, colostrum or formula, we want to make sure that they're getting the appropriate amounts, meaning very small amounts in the beginning and then gradually increasing those amounts. The stools of the newborn look very different. The first stool is the meconium, which is that thick, tarry substance that is um, super difficult to get off the skin. It kind of acted like a plug in the gut. Sometimes babies will release that stool before they're born. It will be in the fluid. We want to be careful that they don't um, suck in any of that meconium stained fluid because the meconium does not do well in the lungs. Uh, and then after the meconium, it will turn into a transitional stool and then a milk stool. And that will look different depending on the type of milk that that baby is um, taking in. So breastfed newborns usually have a yellow gold uh, stringy, it almost has a seedy appearance. And formula fed babies typically have a yellow to a yellow green and it can be loose or pasty or formed depending on the type of um, nutrition again that they are, they are getting. So here's a picture. This is the meconium that I was discussing and then day three or four it starts to turn to transitional stool. This is a really important uh, fact that uh, everyone needs to understand, both nursing student and parents. So we need to educate the parents. If we are breastfeeding our baby and we do not have transitional stool by day three or four, it is very likely the baby is not getting all that they need, that maybe there is an issue with the milk supply. And this is an important fact because by day three or four, these parents are home with their babies already. So this is something that we need to educate them about. They need to be looking on day three or four to make sure that we have transitional stool. It should no longer look like this. And there are some other ways that we know that baby's getting enough, and I'll be discussing that, but this is a really important fact. And then by, day, by about day four or five, we should see the breastfed, pasty, yellow, seedy stool. Sometimes these babies will also have um, a little bit of what looks to be um, blood in their diaper and this is just some crystallization that happened in the kidneys and it and it is not uncommon if it's a little girl baby it could be that they are um, experiencing uh, the hormones are decreasing that they got from their mother the hormones in their body are they're clearing them out and they may even have a little bit of bleeding coming from the vagina and um, with the mucusy discharge and that's normal it won't last, it, you probably will only see it once or twice, but by educating parents that this is a normal occurrence, then they would know um, what to look like, what to look for and what to report. The other thing that happens with our renal system is they have a limited ability to concentrate urine until they are about three months of age. So what we want to see is 
um, six to eight wet diapers a day by the time they are one week old. So we have to give parents good expectations and this needs to be in writing because new parents are exhausted. We have to give, give them good expectations of what to expect and what to report. So again, by day three or four, we should start to see that transitional stool moving from meconium on into that a more yellow casey or um, brown casey stool. And then by the first week of life, by day seven, we should see six to eight wet diapers every day. And if we don't, that is another sign that our baby is not getting enough. Our babies do not have the ability to, to um, they don't have the reserves. So if they're not getting enough, we can have a, a dehydrated, very critical baby very quickly. So we want to make sure that um, we're giving the parents good expectations so they know when to seek help and or when to um, uh, move into the direction of using some supplementation. So this is an example of a feeding log that we might give to parents. We give them um, just an easy way to keep track of it. There are lots of apps available uh, for both of the different devices that are out there for the phones. And um, even parents can sign on to the same app so they can keep track of it. And this is just a great way, especially in those first weeks when you're so exhausted, to know that your baby is getting what it needs. So feedings, we wanna see a minimum of eight to 10 feedings in 24 hours. Wet diapers, depending on the day of life, day one, we wanna see one wet diaper, day two, we wanna see two wet diapers, but by day seven, we should have six to eight wet diapers. And then we wanna see several um, soiled diapers and they should be yellow by the time that we are on day seven. So here are your expectations by um, the age of week one. The respiratory system, um, we have surfactant that helps our alveoli open up and it's a soapy substance that opens that alveoli and allows for that oxygen uh, exchange to happen. Our premature babies sometimes do not have the surfactant production, so we are going to be watching very closely for respiratory distress. All babies are at risk for respiratory distress, so all babies will have this assessment. And we should be, we need to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. So if you um, are looking at a newborn, we want to see our respiration somewhere between 30 and 60 breaths per minute. We listen for the full minute because sometimes babies can have periodic breathing or they can even have um, apnea for up to 15 seconds or more. So we need to listen for the full minute in order to know, to get an accurate count of what those respirations are. And then we want to see symmetrical chest movements. We don't want to see any retracting. We don't want to hear any noises like grunting where babies sometimes will use their accessory muscles to really help them breathe. So it might sound like, Eh, eh. That is, that's a sign that they're working very hard. Nasal flaring, um, uh, like I said, uh, retractions in between the ribs, intercostal retractions or subcostal um, retractions underneath the ribs. So we would want to make sure that all babies are being assessed for respiratory um, depression at all times or respiratory distress. This is a baby that has just been born, baby comes out, takes a big deep breath, pushes all that fluid out of their lungs, starts to circulate the blood flow through the lungs and starts to do its own oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. And it all happens at that moment of that first breath. Again, we're moving from um, fetal to newborn circulation in our cardiovascular system and we see um, changes in our fetal structures, the foramen ovale, ductus arteriosus, ductus venosus, and umbilical arteries and veins are all going to change. And we need to be on the lookout for signs that this is not working well. One of the ways that we, one of the assessment tools that we're using is listening to the cardiac function and listening for murmurs. A murmur is very common in the first couple of days. And it isn't something that should be alarming, but it should be reported to the pediatrician in case they um, want to search further to make sure that we don't have some sort of structural abnormality in the heart. It is a very common occurrence because it sometimes takes a little while for the ductus arteriosus to close. And so as it's in the process of closing, we might hear that murmur. 
but listening closely to um, the, the heart rate of the newborn, we're going to be listening with our stethoscope, our apical pulse is what we'll be listening to. And we're listening for things like murmurs and um, unusual uh, heart sounds. Here's an example of the fetal heart, what a picture of what I was just saying. And you can see that um, we are going to have a couple of different places. This is the ductus arteriosus here. And then we have our foramen ovale here. And at the time um, of a newborn, they are going to start to close that area here. And then the foramen ovale, which is in um, behind in this area, is going to close as well. Kind of amazing that it all works out as well as it does, as often as it does. I've already talked about this, but they are predisposed to heat loss, and that's because they do not have the ability to shiver. They have limited stores of glucose. Their glucose levels are much lower than ours. They don't have a lot of um, use of voluntary muscle control, and they have a large body surface area relative to the body weight. They don't have a lot of subcutaneous fat. They can't adjust their own clothing and they can't communicate that they're too cold or too warm. And most babies won't spend a lot of energy crying if they're too cold because they're trying to conserve that energy. So we want to make sure that these babies stay um, nice and warm and aren't exposed to that cold stress, as I mentioned before. Here are a couple of ways that we lose heat. It can happen with evaporation by being in wet clothing, having wet hair, um, having a, a wet diaper, cold hands, or a, a scale that could be um, conduction. We might have convection, so open hallway, being near the air conditioner, that can cool the baby down, or radiant heat loss, which is near cold surfaces, like a cold window or um, uh, outside walls. So we want to make sure that, um, think about all of these different ways that babies cool off, we, we um, account for those. One of the ways that we take a baby's temperature is axillary. It's important to put the thermometer underneath the arm and, and make sure the end of that thermometer is not poking out the other side. You can even turn this thermometer um, so that it's a little bit lengthwise, and then you hold the arm down in order to get a good temperature. We no longer are routinely doing rectal temperatures. There's too much chance for having um, an injury. So most uh, facilities are using axillary temperatures only for newborns. We are checking in our assessment to make sure that the anus is patent, looking for stool and that sort of thing, but we're not putting anything inside there. And then if we do have to warm a baby up, of course the first way we would want to attempt that would be putting that baby skin to skin either with mom or dad. And then um, if that isn't, if they aren't available or if that isn't working or if mom is cold, we might use a radiant warmer. This is a, a warmer that is used in the presence of the um, healthcare uh, professionals. We don't ever leave a baby on a warmer when we are walking out of a room. The only time a baby can be left on a warmer outside of our presence is if they have um, the, the temperature probe attached and the warmer changed over to make sure that it is picking up that baby's temperature. You can barely see this here, but there's a little heart, little sticker that's holding this temp probe on this baby. And that will allow this um, machine to know what the temperature is and either heat up or cool down based on the baby's temperature. But again, we would never leave a baby on a warmer and we have to educate the family members sometimes because they see us utilize these warmers and they will do it when we're out of the room. But there is the potential of overheating the baby to the point of um, it being uh, an emergency if we uh, leave babies on these warmers unattended without that temperature probe. The other thing our babies um, are not very good at yet is their immune system. They are going to depend on immunity from their mothers and it crosses the placenta in that third trimester. Some of these immunities found are, uh, will protect against bacterial and viral infections. And if mother has developed antibodies either naturally or through a vaccine, they will pass these antibodies on to that newborn. And the newborn can start to utilize these antibodies for several weeks and months before they start to develop their own. 
this is why it's so important that moms receive those vaccines later in pregnancy in that third trimester. We want to see her, if it's flu season, have the flu vaccine. We want to see her have the DPAP, the, which includes the whooping cough, um, and make sure that those are available to this baby in the first couple of uh, weeks and months of life. The integumentary system is typically covered in this vernix, this white cheesy substance. This helps that baby stay um, waterproof on the inside. This baby has an unusual amount of, of this vernix. And one of the things we know is that the more vernix they have, it is inversely related to the surfactant in their lungs. So if you have a baby born with a ton of vernix, you want to watch this baby very closely for potential um, breathing difficulties and respiratory distress, because it may mean that they don't have the um, surfactant production that needs to be there. This vernix, we used to scrub it off and wipe it off, and we now know that it um, prevents absorption of harmful things. It uh, helps in thermoregulation. It, pr it protects against physical trauma, and it, there may be some factors that it helps to um, uh, gain some of that bacteria from the mom when they're skin to skin, and that bacteria now can go and seed the gut, which will in turn affect the baby's immune system. So we know that there's no reason for us to bathe babies right away. It's actually not evidence-based based to do baths right away, and we certainly don't want to wash this vernix off. We want it to just um, soak into the skin naturally. It's there for a reason. Um, we know that our babies will develop cephalocaudal, which means starting at the head, moving towards the tail, and proximal distal, so starting at the point of um, uh, uh, a point of attachment and moving distally, which is further out. So these babies will um, follow the same patterns of of development, and this is why it's important for us to recognize as as pediatric nurses, especially to recognize those growth and development patterns to know whether the baby is developing normally. They also have an, they're born with an acute sense of hearing, smell, and taste. We are going to do a hearing screen to make sure that they have um, hearing capability, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then they have certain reflexes that are an indication of their neurological development and function. So if you're doing your assessment, um, your initial assessment, and you don't have the reflexes that you're expecting, we might want to look a little further for um, the potential that maybe there's some um, developmental issues with this newborn. So the, the reflexes that we're looking for, this moral reflex, also called startle reflex, we see the grasp, our rooting reflex, and then this step reflex, it isn't there for very long, and it's not necessary for us to test this one, but the moral reflex, this can be useful if we're worried about a shoulder injury. We can um, allow the baby lift their arms and then gently drop them, and the baby should have a startle and use both of its arms during that startle reflex. The grasp is super easy to, to see because they're constantly grasping at things. And then the rooting reflex, when you touch the baby's cheek and they turn towards that touch is um, one of the things that we can see if they are ready for feeding because if they are actively interested in feeding they will have the rooting reflex but full-term infants the ones that we're really looking for to give us a good idea of how they're doing neurologically is blinking sneezing gagging sucking and grasping and these are the ones that we will pay attention to so now we've moved away from our chapter 17, which was our transition. And um, I'll talk more about the assessment that we do in that um, period in just a minute. And we're gonna move into nursing management of the newborn. So behavioral patterns of newborns, when that first 30 minutes to two hours is what we call their reactive time. Some people refer to it as the golden hour. This is their time when they're getting used to being out of the womb, they're getting used to breathing, they're getting used to their um, cardiovascular system, supplying all that they need, and they will start to look around, be alert, hopefully, start to bond with their mother and their, their other parents, and they may start to look for feeding. That's an instinct for them to feed. 
we really want to get their first feeding in before we do any sort of intervention. There's no reason to separate mom and baby. We don't have to do the weight right away. We don't have to do our measurements. There's no reason to do the medications right away. We want to let that baby have an uninterrupted skin to skin time with the mother and have its first feeding before we interrupt that time. And then we see a period of decreased responsiveness. So this baby now, um, somewhere between 30 and 120 minutes, is going to get sleepy because they do take frequent naps. And that was, birth was uh, an adventure for them as well. And so they may sleep um, for sometimes even a couple of hours, depending on their birth experience. So we want to get that first feeding in for another reason is because now we know they're going to have a very sleepy time and we won't have the ability to get those calories in. And then they will have a second period of reactivity sometime between the two and eight hours of birth and they start to show interest in feeding again. And so a lot of times what I see is something that looks like this. The baby's born, mom has some skin to skin time, all the family members that have been waiting to come and see this baby are so excited. So mom may even interrupt that skin to skin time or interrupt that feeding um, because she wants to share her experience with her family members and now this baby's passed around and then maybe even more people come and, and more visitors come and we're so excited and they spend several hours ooing and eyeing over the baby talking about the birth experience and now it's time for them all to go home and here we are in our second period of reactivity usually the middle of the night or uh, early morning hours, and this is when baby wakes, and mom has not rested since birth because she's been too busy entertaining. So I really try to educate my parents, spend that unlimited amount of time early on, let this baby get a good feeding. Once this baby goes to sleep, this is your time to catch up on your sleep, and then later, maybe even the next day, would be a great time for people to come and visit this baby. They, they, we, we've got to support our families in making good decisions. And of course, we want their families to be there to support them, but just giving them an idea of what the next few hours are going to look like and how lonely that time is in the middle of the night when mom is awake and has been awake the entire time. Um, and now she has a baby that is hungry and needs to feed and is looking for some <clears throat> attention. So our initial newborn assessment, this is the one that we would do initially when the baby is first born, we, this is what we call our, um, our first newborn assessment, is very, very thorough. We're looking for lots of things. Every uh, subsequent assessment after that is a little bit less. We don't have as many um, uh, factors that we need to look at once we have <clears throat> looked at our baby initially. So signs that we might have a problem, um, nasal flaring, chest retractions, grunting, labored breathing, uh, central cyanosis, a flaccid body posture, any abnormal breath sounds or abnormal respiratory rate. Now, sometimes the initial respiratory rate can be a little high as they're working some of that fluid out, but it should, in the first hour or so, um, the, it should start to come down to that normal range of 30 to 60 abnormal heart rates or abnormal newborn size. These are all things that we want to be on the lookout for. So here are some signs of those retractions that I was discussing earlier. This would be um, underneath the ribs and you can see it's really being pulled in there. And here is your intercostal retraction, substernal and intercostal retraction. So just some pictures of babies that are working a little hard to breathe. And that would be one of the things that we would be looking at. Here again is a picture that has um, a baby that it, it, all of its reflexes are doing well. You can see that the hands are a little bit blue. That's normal. It's called acrocyanosis. Sometimes the feet will be just as blue. That could go on for several hours, even as much as um, 48 hours. So it's not uncommon to see hands and feet that are blue, but the rest of the baby's body all around the mouth and the nose and the chest should be pink. We call that central cyanosis if it is not pink, and that is a sign that the baby is not exchanging oxygen well. So here's a baby that, um, same picture that I showed you earlier, of a baby that needs some support. This is just a neonatal resuscitation 
uh, this is our NRP, Neonatal Resuscitation Program, and this is an algorithm that we follow. So this tells us what we need to do. If this is happening, then we do this. If this is happening, then we do this. If this is happening, then we do this. If you're going to be working in labor and delivery or in um, NICU, uh, you will be taking neonatal resuscitation. This will be an additional certification that you will maintain. Again, our initial assessment is going to include that APGAR score. We're going to eventually look at our length and weight and vital signs. And the reason why we're getting our length and weight is because that's the most uh, first question most people ask. Oh, you had a baby, how much did it weigh? But really we wanna make sure that it's length and weight are appropriate for its gestational age. And we're going to be doing a gestational age assessment. This also gives us a baseline. So we know how much weight the baby has lost in the first few days and um, to put them on that growth curve to make sure that they're uh, getting the nutrients they need to be able to um, make their uh, milestones as far as that goes. So one of the things we do for the gestational age assessment is a, a called a Ballard score, the tool that we use. And we're looking at things like skin texture, how much lanugo, which is that little um, fur that sometimes they have on them, a little bit of extra hair on their shoulders. We're watching their planter creases, how many creases are on the bottom of their feet, looking at their breast tissue, eyes, ears, and genitalia. And the, the, looking at the physical maturity and then looking at some of the neuromuscular maturity will allow us to decide where they are. And we're about, we can get within about a week or so, week or two weeks on the gestational age assessment. So we should be looking to make sure that the baby is as old as we thought it was. Here's that APGAR score again that I mentioned, activity, pulse, grimace, appearance, and respiration. I think I said it backwards last time, but there's two A's in APGAR, so you can put either one in either place, and you're going to be giving these points, and a severely depressed baby is zero to three, a moderately depressed baby is four to six, and we will continue doing this score every 10 minutes until we get over a seven. So we do it at one minute, five minutes, We'll do it again at, five, um, at, at the 10 minute of life. And we just keep going until we get over a seven because this says that we're still supporting this baby in some way. And then excellent condition is a seven to a 10. And our most common is somewhere between an eight and a nine. We very rarely see 10. And there's another picture of babies. And you can, you can decide what you think this baby's APGAR score is. Here's an example of how we do some of our measurements. We do it in centimeters, and if you do it the same way every time with every baby, then you will develop your own practice. But typically, we go above the ears um, to, I, I like to go a little closer above the eyebrows when I'm measuring head, and then at chest is typically at the nipple line, and then when we get to the abdomen, we're right at the umbilicus. This is a picture of the Ballard score. And again, this is looking at some of the different postures that we might see in our neuromuscular exam. And here we are looking at that physical maturity that I mentioned before. And by the time we do all of this calculation, we should be able to find um, within a week or two what gestational age this baby is. When we are referring to gestational age, anything before 37 weeks is considered preterm. Term, uh, according to your textbook, is somewhere between 38 to 42 weeks. Now, we would not encourage a delivery that wasn't imminent uh, before the 39th week. We do want to wait until the 39th week before we intervene. So let's say she's having contractions and maybe she's a centimeter or two dilated. There would be no reason to assist that with medication until she gets past her 39th week. We want these babies to come on their own time. Now that's not saying she might go into full-blown labor on her own and deliver before 39 weeks, and we're not gonna stop that, but we wouldn't encourage it. A post-term or post-date delivery uh, a gestation would be after 42 weeks. You rarely will see a 42-week pregnancy because most physicians are actively involved in trying to get um, these babies uh, earth side, born, induced be, by the 41st week. Then we have some other terms that we would look at, small for gestational age, appropriate for gestational age, or large for gestational age. So some of the disease processes that we've talked about that might contribute to these um, different um, 
determinations of these babies so small for gestational age might be our moms that had hypertension and or preeclampsia because these babies didn't get everything they needed through that placenta and then large for gestational age might be our our babies that are born to diabetic mothers so looking at these uh, delineations might help us to determine if there were some other issues with the pregnancy that maybe we were aware or unaware of Here's a picture of two babies that um, are not the same gestational age. So here you have a small for gestational age, and this baby has a very um, premature look. You can see that it is a has that frog-like posture, and here is a term baby that has the appropriate neuromuscular development. And here are two babies. This is a average for gestational age and a large for gestational age baby. And this is what I was talking about looking at the creases on the soles of the foot. This is a really quick assessment. Those of you that plan on working in ER or maybe even um, any other place that might receive um, emergency deliveries, you would look very closely or very quickly at the foot. And it, you can see this baby's skin has is very thin and translucent and does not have the same creases that this baby has. When you have three creases across the bottom of the foot, you're looking at a term baby. When you have no creases um, across the bottom of the foot, you're looking at a pretty premature baby, less than 30 weeks. And these creases will, will happen, so one will happen and then you'll have two and then you'll have three. So this is just a quick way of us determining uh, gestational age. Making sure again that we are uh, always airway breathing circulation. The first thing we want to do is make sure we have a, a patent airway. We would follow our neonatal resuscitation uh, program process if we do not. Then we want to maintain our temperature or thermal regulation by putting that baby skin to skin. And then eventually we'll get to the point of doing our measurements, making sure we band this baby and, and its parents, um, doing our weighing, and we would then um, start to think about administering our medications, vitamin K, eye prophylaxis. Um, vitamin K is given to all newborns in all 50 states, and so is the eye prophylaxis. It can be declined by the parent after good education and they will have to sign um, a consent saying that they recognize that it's recommended and they're refusing. We also wanna know a little bit about the prenatal history. It helps us to know what types of things to look for in the newborn. We, um, with our, our newborn exam, again, we're going to be looking at all the vital signs that I just mentioned. And in addition, in our initial newborn exam, we're going to look at things like are there skin variations? Are there birthmarks that need to be noted? We want to make sure that the um, head size is appropriate, fontanelles are not depressed or um, bulging. We are going to look at any abnormalities in the head size. We're going to be looking at the face, nose, mouth, eyes, and ears. Are the eyes low set? Uh, I'm sorry, are the ears low set? Is the um, mouth complete? Do they have any sort of cleft palate, cleft lip? Looking at the neck and chest, is there, is there any abnormalities there? Um, looking for fatty patches on the back of the neck. Abdomen, is there, are there any loops? Do we see any um, um, abnormalities in the abdomen? Looking at the genitalia. Looking at the extremities in the back to make sure that there are no openings. And then again, looking at the alertness, muscle tone, and reflexes. Here are a couple of the pictures of the things that I had mentioned. This is a normally formed ear in its normal position. You can see that this is a small, small formed ear in a low set position. So when we have a, a low set position, we are concerned that um, this, this could be consistent with some congenital uh, malformations and congenital anomalies. So this would be something that we would want to make sure that we notate and um, uh, inform our pediatrician. This is called a skin tag, also something that we would want to inform our pediatrician. It's consistent with um, several congenital um, abnormalities. It can be just a, a variation, but it, we wanna make sure that we rule out those other issues. 
these babies have crossed eyes. It's normal. They don't have full control over them. I've had some parents that were very upset that their babies look like this. And we just let them know that in um, just a few short days, weeks, these babies will have a better control over their eyes and this won't be happening. Some of the skin variations in newborns, I'm gonna show you pictures of all the different ones that are possible. So here we have our vernix that I mentioned before. Again, not necessary for us to scrub that off. This is what we would call Mongolian spots. These are associated with different skin tones, usually darker skin tones, but they resemble bruising. They're not bruising. This is just a variation in the skin tone. So it's important for us to notate that Mongolian spots are present because this could, um, let's say this baby comes back in in a week because it's having issues with jaundice. An ER nurse might mistake this for bruising and we could go back into the medical record and make sure that Mongolian spots were noted um, on delivery. And that could save um, a lot of misunderstanding. This is what we call milia. These are just blocked blood vessels. Uh, I'm sorry, blocked skin. It's just in our um, uh, skin. There's no reason for us to pop them. It's not an infection. It's a uh, normal skin variation and it will go away. So we just tell parents this milia is normal. This is what we might call a stork bite. It is a discoloration in the skin. And um, sometimes these lighten as the babies get older and sometimes they stay about the same. You frequently see them on the back of the neck and occasionally on the forehead. Here's what we call a strawberry angioma. And this would be a, um, go back here. Uh, that would be your harlequin sign. Um, I'm sorry, this is port wine stain. This is a, uh, sometimes can happen on the face and sometimes can happen on the neck. Very, um, I would say it's fairly common and parents can be very upset that there's discoloration on the skin, but that's truly all it is. It's a discoloration of the skin. This is not the Harlequin sign as I previously stated, I apologize. So again, this would just be something that we would wanna notate and put into the medical record. This is what we call our um, newborn erythemia or uh, uh, newborn rash. And it's the newborn is clearing the mother's hormones again and nothing to be concerned about. But you can see that from the looks of it, a new mom might be very concerned that her baby suddenly has a rash. This is normal and to be expected and there's nothing that we need to do to fix that. There can also be variations in the head size and shape. So we need to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. Molding is very normal. This is where those bones slide on top of each other in order for that baby to fit through that pelvis. Tappet is, is a normal occurrence. We see this, there, it's swelling um, up underneath the tissue and to be expected and there's nothing that we need to do. Now a cephalohematoma is where we have some bleeding and I'll show you how to determine the difference between these two. Cephalohematoma we need to be on the lookout for. Um, it can cause increased intracranial pressure. It can also um, increase our chance for those excess red blood cells that need to be broken down because it is blood and that will need to be broken down. And so this can increase our chance for jaundice. Other things that we might see, microcephaly, which is an ab uh, abnormally small head, macrocephaly, which is an abnormally large head, and then either large, small, or closed fontanelles. This is caput uh, and swelling and molding, and you can see this baby probably had a vacuum. This will get better in a very um, short period of time. This will, in, within a couple of hours, will look very different. We want to be on the lookout to make sure that we don't have a cephalohematoma here, and I'll show you how to look at that in just a minute. But these four bones that this baby has are have slid on top of each other in order for that baby's head to fit through the maternal pelvis. Here is a baby that has a cephalohematoma. So um, a cephalohematoma is bleeding underneath the skull. And the way we know it's a cephalohematoma and not cap it, so this is just fluid, swelling, is because the cephalohematoma does not cross the suture line. 
the suture line is where those bones will eventually um, fill in and become solid. And so you can see this is bleeding and does not cross the suture line, does not cross the suture line. You can see the suture line here, and you can tell that this is deep bleeding, and so this is a cephalohematoma. Caput, on the other hand, does cross the suture line because it's much further up. It's not as deeply in the, um, it's not next to the brain, it's on top of the dura. So you will see swelling that does cross the suture line. This is just excess fluid and nothing needs to be done. This is bleeding and we need to be on close lookout. We'd be looking at reflexes, feeding behavior, um, other signs of intracranial pressure, high-pitched crying, that sort of thing. And of course, that jaundice that I mentioned. This is a baby that has hydrocephaly, um, has a blockage in there that is not allowing the um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid to be in the right places. And so this baby will need surgery to um, have a drain placed. In fact, that's probably what that scarring is, is a drain. And then here you see a picture of microcephaly. And these babies um, are not going to have normal brain development. And the disease process that we see with this in the most recent years has been Zika. Zika infection in the, mo in the mother while pregnant can cause microcephaly in the babies. We do see this um, a little bit with cytomegalovirus, CMV infection as well. So other common concerns that we see during newborn transition are transient tachypnea of the newborn, physiologic jaundice, and hypoglycemia. And we will cover each one of these. So transient tachypnea is um, just how it sounds. It's fast breathing that comes and goes. These babies sometimes during transition will have a little bit of transient tachypnea. So some of our nursing interventions during this time is providing oxygen if it is um, causing this baby to have a low oxygen level or if the baby is looking like it's becoming more severely respiratory depressed or, or distressed. We want to make sure that they're staying nice and warm. We can do this skin to skin with the mom. Sometimes they just need a little bit of time to transition. By turning them over on their stomach, and allowing them to open this chest, maybe they will actually be able to drain some of that fluid out, and that might help them. Observing them frequently, so this is a baby, you're gonna be at the bedside, and then just allowing time for those capillaries to empty and the lymphatics to empty. So this is part of that transition period. But we wanna watch these babies closely to make sure that they're not moving into a more um, distressed pattern. Some of the screenings that we do for newborns are a newborn screen, a hearing screen, a congenital heart screen, and a jaundice risk category. And I am going to talk about hypoglycemia and jaundice as we continue on through the slides. These screenings are um, what we do on all newborns. This is what we call the newborn screen. It used to be called the PKU, and sometimes even in NCLEX, you'll see it referred to as a PKU, which is a phenylketonuria, one of the tests that is actually in the newborn screen. But there are over 70 different tests in this screening. And this is a little bit older picture. There's actually seven circles in California now. And so this is um, litmus paper. It's just a little drop of blood that's taken from the heel. We put it on the litmus paper. It gets, um, there's a form attached, and it gets uh, sent to the state. We want to make sure that the information on the form is extremely accurate as of that day because that's where the state will contact the parent if this screening exam comes back positive. And so again, this is just a screening and there would be more testing that would need to happen if they do determine that one of the screens are positive. When you're taking blood from a newborn, you place your thumb right in this area and anywhere that your thumb is not is where you can actually use the lancet to um, prick the heel and remove the blood. The reason why is this is the, the medius part of the foot and you have the least likely chance of, of causing nerve damage in this area. If you put the lancet in this area where your thumb is covering, you could um, potentially uh, hit nerve or even bone because it's just it's, the skin is very thin there. So we want to be very careful about where we draw blood from this baby. And this is um, capillary, so we cannot draw a venous sample and place it on here. It needs to be capillary. 
here is the example of the, oh, sorry, there's six circles, not seven. Um, this is an example of the form that needs to be filled out. And as the RN, you will be responsible to make sure this form is completed appropriately. Now, each facility is going to have its own policy, and sometimes they do authorize other people that are not nurses to complete the forms. The sample needs to be drawn by um, a registered nurse, at least in California. Uh, actually, LVN can do this as well, but it needs to be a licensed nurse. And then um, the form needs to be looked at by the um, primary nurse taking care of the baby. It's very important. If this form is filled out incorrectly, the sample is considered invalid and then has to be redrawn. Now, the disease processes that we're looking for, I didn't mention, most of them um, can be controlled, or, or I will say a good portion of them can be controlled with either a diet modification and or medication. So it's very important that we identify these disease processes very early so that we can make those modifications, assist the family in making those modifications so that, the, um, that we can actually change the outcome of what's going on. Two examples that I can think of right off the, the bat is phenylketonuria. We would change their diets very specifically. And hypothyroidism, we would give them simply some thyroid hormone, and that would um, change the outcome for these babies. The hearing screen is a program where they actually place these little headphones on the baby. They will um, produce these clicking noises, and then they pick up brain waves when the babies hear that clicking noise. It's not uncommon for newborns, to their ears, to have a little bit of fluid in them. So occasionally, they will not pass either one ear or both, and that test will have to be repeated. Again, this is just a screening tool. If they um, do fail the screen three times, they will be um, recommended for further follow-up to determine if there actually is some congenital hearing loss. Looking for heart defects, there's a congenital heart screening that we do before these babies go home, and that is where we simply put an O2 sat on a preductal area like the hand and on a postductal area like the foot, so before um, the heart and, and after the heart. And so it, we then look at the differences in those O2 saturations. If there's more than a 3% um, difference in like the right hand and the foot um, on three different occasions, then we would consider that a failed screen and we would have to go to further uh, screening measures. Like at that point, they would probably order a um, ultrasound of the heart an echo to make sure that we don't have any screening or don't have any heart defects. And this is what it looks like. It's just an O2 sat, non-invasive, simply done, but these must be done at the same time. So you have to have two of these in order to um, look at those numbers. And then some of the conditions that we're looking for, the most common cardiac conditions that we see, tetralogy of flow, atrial septal defects, often referred to as ASDs, ventricle septal defects, VSDs, and patent ductus arteriosus, also known as a PDA. So these are our most common congenital heart conditions. I'm not going to go into depth about them here. I know that you've seen this in some of your other um, courses, pediatrics to be specific. But if you are interested in learning more about these, you can go to Cincinnati Heart. Cincinnati um, Children's Hospital has a really fantastic website that has some flash movies that will show you the differences between um, uh, normal cardiac behavior and what the um, heart looks like in all of these different conditions. So now we're going to move into jaundice. When I'm talking about jaundice, as I mentioned before, we're talking about physiological jaundice. This is a pretty natural process. Our liver is is um, immature and there is increased red blood cells that baby gets from mom. There's also increased red blood cells that sometimes need to be broken down after delivery. If there's bruising, if there's a hematoma like we mentioned, if um, their liver is immature, so the more premature they are, uh, they may have a harder time breaking down these excess red blood cells and, and clearing this bilirubin. The way bilirubin is cleared from the body is through the stool as a newborn, and a little bit through the skin. So through the, if the baby is eating really well, and there's uh, large amounts of milk available, 
um, large amounts as in um, you know the appropriate amount when newborns are are born remember they have small tummies and and but that they're eating effectively they're able to get that milk out of the breast they're able to um, have effective milk transfer then they will be stooling and getting the and moving this billy ribbon out with their meconium but if they are lethargic or they're a little premature or they aren't eating well or they don't have effective milk transfer or they're not feeling well or they've got other things going on in their body um, like they're having issues with hypoglycemia all of these will affect the ability of getting the excess bilirubin out of the body when we have the bilirubin levels that are rising they, they naturally rise for about the first three days and then they should um, start to level out but if they're rising at the rate that um, is so high that th that they get to critical levels they are toxic on the brain so we are going to be watching very closely and determining what risk category this baby is in here are some other things that increase the baby's chance of having jaundice these are jaundice risk factors immaturity like i said RH or ABO, blood incompatibility, the use of oxytocin in labor, maternal diabetes, neonatal hyperthyroidism, um, bruising, as I mentioned. So this is what we call a bilinomograph, a bilirubin nomograph. And this is evidence-based practice. Every hospital should be utilizing a bilirubin nomograph. They're easily found online. There are several different versions. This one happens to be from Medscape. And what this looks at is the hours old of the baby and the serum bilirubin level, or the, if you're not doing serums, it could be a combination of transcutaneous bilirubin and or serum. So this baby, this is a transcutaneous bilimeter, and this can be used. It's non-invasive. It just goes on the skin, and it gives you a level of bilirubin. Now, most facilities, if they... Are using a combination if you reach a certain level with your transcutaneous you now have to follow it up with blood a serum to make sure that you are um, getting accurate levels so let's say this baby is 24 hours old and its bilirubin is 10 you can see here's your 24 hours and your level is 10 this is the high risk zone the reason why this is high risk is because at 24 hours we know that for the next two days, we are going to continue to climb. And up in this area, we know brain damage can happen. So we're not exactly sure which level for which baby, but we know as we started getting into the high teens and into the 20s, we are at risk for injury to the brain from the toxic level of bilirubin. So here we have a low risk zone, and then most label this one as the um, uh, low intermediate zone, high intermediate zone, and then high risk. So each of these risk assessments, these zones will give us different nursing interventions. So if my baby is 24 hours old and the bilirubin is four, so let's say this is your four, we know we're in the low risk zone and I'm not too concerned as it rises over the next couple of days that I'm going to get to a critical level. So this is one of the tools that we use in order to give a risk assessment and then to be able to give proper education to the parents of what we need to do in the next couple of days. Because what we don't want to happen is to send them home, then be in the high risk or the high intermediate level, then get into the high risk and then not know what to do or um, do nothing and then the baby suffer damage because of that. So this is our um, umbilical cord. Uh, once the baby is born eventually it's going to be clamped within the first couple of minutes and then we're going it's going to start the process of drying we want to just keep it clean dry we don't have to put anything on it we don't have to do anything to it keep the diaper from rubbing across make sure that the parents have been educated good good signs and symptoms to look for we don't want any redness or bleeding or foul smell or discharge and eventually it's going to come off on its own and then at that point once it's come off on its own the baby can then be immersed in a bathtub until that point we only want a sponge bath given this is a bulb syringe this is our uh, additional education that we need to give to the parents so when we're using a bulb syringe we want it to be within arm's reach at all times this bulb syringe could save them from a 911 call so 
Squeeze it, put it in the side of the mouth, suck out whatever's there. Squeeze it, put it in the other side of the mouth, suck out whatever's there. And then you can also go up to the nose. It just needs to be cleaned with um, soapy water. This is what a safe sleep environment looks like. This is our, how our babies should be put in their cribs with no extra padding. Unfortunately, this came straight out of a Baby's RS catalog, and this is not a safe sleep environment. So all this extra padding and stuff they want you to buy is not what needs to be in your baby's crib. In order to decrease the amount of SIDS, this is one of the things that they have worked very hard is um, letting people know what a safe sleep environment is. And we need to make sure that parents are aware. We don't want anything that can fall into the crib. Babies don't need to be wrapped up in several blankets. We don't even want stuffed animals in the crib. A nice firm surface, very important. The other discharge, topping, uh, discharge teaching topics are here. All of these things will need to be covered before we um, send these families home. We are educating from the moment they walk in through those doors until the moment they walk out. Lots of information that we want to make sure that these parents have before they leave with their baby. Um, making sure that they, they know what signs and symptoms to report, when they're going to follow up, and what immunization information they, um, what the baby received in the hospital, and then what needs to happen in the next few days. Other simple education would be um, not to allow sick people around your baby, and certainly don't want your baby out in a grocery store, and just things that we kind of take as common sense. We want to make sure that new parents know. Super important. Here are the warning signs for a newborn. And I'll let you read through this. These are signs and symptoms that should be reported immediately. Babies do not have the ability to go without food. So if they have persistent vomiting, diarrhea, less than six wet diapers in 24 hours, no stool for four days, will not feed, we cannot wait. These babies cannot go a couple of days without eating like adults can. They don't have the reserve. So we need to intervene immediately. So I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrition. And again, this is getting the calories in that this baby needs. They don't need any extra fluid requirements other than what is in the breast milk or formula, depending on the choice that the mom has. And this is actually the natural feeding position. We call this the ventral position or um, the tummy to tummy position. And babies really like to go to the breast and find it themselves and self-attach. When they're in other positions that are a little more convenient to the mom, sitting up, being held, being held in the football position, sometimes they struggle a little bit to get onto that breast. So if you're having breastfeeding issues, the first thing I would suggest is to get into this position. Or if you're having trouble helping a mom with breastfeeding, you wanna get into this position and see if that baby can self-attach. The physiology of breastfeeding is the baby attaches to the breast, removes milk from the breast, this sends a message to the mom, there is suckling happening, milk is being taken out of the breast, and milk needs to, the production needs to be increased. It's a combination of stimulation and hormones that cause this milk to be made. So if we have poor management in the beginning, we can have decreased supplies. If we have a lot of pacifier use, we can have decreased supplies. If we have poor milk transfer, baby's not able to get the milk out for whatever reason, we can have decreased supplies. So all of this is um, important, and this is when a lactation consultant might be brought into the picture to try to determine what the problem is and how we can remedy it. We do something called a latch assessment where we're looking at how well the baby latches. Do we have audible swallowing? What's the nipple type of the mother? What's the comfort level and how much, mother, how much help the mother actually needs? This is a quick assessment that all nurses in the postpartum unit or NICU can do to help other people that are coming in to assist this mom um, to, to provide information on how well the latch is actually happening. And I should note here, this picture is showing you that this baby actually latches way up here onto the areola. So this baby is going to come way here to the areola. The nipple is just a conduit that is going to be pulled into the back of the mouth. What they actually need to do is, is attach to the breast because this is where the stimulation happens. 
So if this baby just gets on that nipple, there is not going to be good milk transfer. And then the mother won't make good milk. The nipple is used to press against the palate and actually create um, a, a, a negative pressure suction to siphon that milk out of the breast. Um, when we are looking at breastfeeding, things that we want to discuss with the mom, that of course the breastfeeding, the milk is perfect for that baby. It changes throughout the day. It changes on how old the baby is, the gestational age. Um, we want to talk about where she can find assistance, where she can get community help if she needs it once she leaves the hospital or if, or if there's a phone number that she can call. Positioning is super important to make sure that our babies are always tummy to tummy. Um, if she's going to be uh, expressing that milk and storing it, the guidelines for storage, they change a little bit whether the baby is a NICU baby or if it is a full-term baby. And then other concerns we might need to cover, sore nipples, engorgement, and mastitis. So this is all education that needs to be given to this mom before she goes home and hopefully um, by a lactation professional. Again, here's just a, a visual representation of the volume. You've got day one, very small amount, about five to seven, five to seven ml is all this baby needs for the first day. And then for the second day, you're going to see this baby's volumes are going to increase. And then third day and then fourth day. So the volumes of milk will increase as the stomach size increases. Again, it's supply and demand. And so each time this baby feeds, it gets a very small amount, and eventually you'll get to the calorie level that you need for that first day. So here's a good um, guideline for moms that lets them know how often the baby should be feeding, what the baby's tummy size is, how many wet diapers we're looking at, how what the average of weight loss is, and it's not uncommon for us to see weight loss in the first two weeks. We want the baby up to birth weight by the time they're two weeks old. And again, that's another sign to let us know how well the baby is feeding. This is at a glance looking at feeding cues. When we get to this sign, when these babies get to this point, they are hungry. They are hangry. They don't wanna learn something new. We want to try to get to these babies in these early feeding cues. This is why it's important to allow the babies to have their hands up near their face so they can start to show you those early feeding signs. And waiting until they're crying is a late feeding cue and these babies are not going to go to breast as well and they're not going to feed for as long and they'll wake up sooner. Looking again at the breast, just showing you a little bit of the anatomy, the milk glands are actually back in the back. And then these are the ducts that need to be massaged in order to bring the milk out of those glands. The amount of fatty tissue in the breast has nothing to do with how many milk glands are in the breast. And correct latching, again, we wanna get this baby latched on as deeply to that breast as we can. Here's a little um, uh, pictorial to show you one way to help get that baby latched on. And again, this is, one of the things that a lactation professional will help with, and most nurses that work in the labor and delivery unit will have some experience and maybe even take some classes or have some required classes in order to help moms breastfeed. This is a breastfeeding with a implant. Um, sometimes you will see a, a breast augmentation or an implant where it is they go through the nipple, and that's where they cut through all these cannulas and then place the implant um, in front of the muscle. Depending on how long ago it was that they cut through those cannulas, we can see some weak cannulization happen um, if it's been a little length of time. We want to watch these mothers very closely, again, looking at those signs and symptoms that baby's getting enough. And then this is the type that goes underneath the muscle. Sometimes they will cut um, uh, near the armpit and, and go underneath the muscle and put the implant there. And they can sever the nerve that goes to the brain that tells the body make milk based on the stimulation. So again, I'm not saying that you can't breastfeed if you have augmentation. It definitely does um, add some, not difficulties, but add some concern where we wanna make sure that the baby is getting what they need. And so you will need to be followed very closely by a um, lactation consultant. This is hand expression. 
bringing that milk out by hand. You don't have to have a pump to do it. You can collect this milk. And if babies are having a hard time getting on, we can collect this first milk called colostrum. And we can use alternative feeding methods to bring it to the babies. Here's another picture. There's some fantastic videos on YouTube about how to hand express. Every breastfeeding mother needs to know how to hand express. Um, we need to know how to get the milk out of that breast in case you and your pump are separated, or if there's some sort of natural disaster or something, you don't have electricity, et cetera. Here are those alternative feeding methods. We can actually put it in a cup and allow the baby to get it this way, or we can put it in a spoon. Now, this would not be a long-term feeding method. It would be too inconvenient for the uh, caregivers of this baby to do it this way, but in the first couple of days, if we're having issues getting this baby latched, or if we want to see exactly what's going into that baby, this baby looks a little jaundiced, so it might be that's why they're supplementing this baby, giving some extra nutrition to get that belly rumen out. This is one method that we can do. We don't always have to go to a nipple and a bottle. Medications and Mother's Milk is the book that is considered the uh, uh, best resource for looking at medications and mother's milk. All lactation consultants have access to this, have a copy of it. We um, will definitely give information out if you're taking a medication or if your patient on another floor is taking a medication and you're not sure it's compatible with breastfeeding, we can give some good guidance to using this reference. This is an example of a breast pump. There's lots of different pumps out there and available and some women choose just the pump. There's all kinds of tips and tricks and tools that go along with pumping. And again, this is when your breastfeeding support group or your breastfeeding professional um, should be available to help you with those pump questions. If we're having engorgement, one of the best tools uh, we can offer, cabbage is a great anti-inflammatory um, vegetable and you can use the leaves. It has a chemical inside. Use the leaves on the inside of your bra that will help decrease that engorgement. Engorgement is when you have tissue swelling all the way around that tissue and that will um, not allow the baby to latch onto the breast well. And it can also be very painful. It can also um, cause a little bit of a low grade fever. So engorgement is something that we deal with quite often. This engorgement comes from the third spacing of all this extra fluid and fluid from pregnancy that these moms are experiencing in the postpartum period. So we want to try to decrease the amount of excess fluid a mom gets, gets in labor if it's not necessary and um, make sure that she's drinking plenty of fluid so that it can, she can draw that off and urinate it out. If our, your mother is choosing to bottle feed, we want to make sure that we're supporting her in that as well. We need to talk about the types of formula. She needs to know about positioning. It's just as important to hold that baby when bottle feeding, whether it be breast milk or formula in that bottle, because it's that closeness that helps with the bonding. And we want to um, talk about how to prepare the formula. We want to give her some education how to prepare her equipment. There's lots of things that go along with bottle feeding that will require education as well. And that's it for our lecture today. Thanks for sticking with me. If you have questions, you know where to reach me.